people ask me all the time, are you tired of that preceding you? And I'm like, hell no. All right, all right, all right. Oh, Christ. How you doing? That was out of my mouth in a scene that was never, I was never supposed to be in, that was never written. I had gone to the set to do a makeup and wardrobe test for Richard Linklater, the director, to approve. He did. While he approved it, he then asked me, hey, do you think Wooderson might be interested in the redheaded intellectual girl in school? And I went, yeah, Wooderson likes all types of chicks, right? And he's like, well, you know, what if you hop in the car here and pull over and try and pick her up? I was like, all right, next thing I know, I got a mic on me and I'm in my first scene, there's nothing written. And I'm starting to get a little nervous about this and I started to go, well, who's my man? Who's Wooderson? You know, who's Wooderson? I said, Wooderson loves his car. And I'm like, well, I'm in my car, there's one. I said, Wooderson loves rock and roll. I said, well, I got Ted Nugent in the in the, in the the eight track, there's two. I said, Wooderson loves to get high. And I'm like, well, Slater's riding shotgun. He's always got a doobie rolled up. And I said, and Wooderson likes picking up chicks. And all of a sudden I heard, action. And I looked up at Marissa Rabisi, the redhead intellectual over there. And as I put it in drive, I thought to myself, I got three out of four and I'm going to get the fourth. All right, all right, all right, and pulled out. And that was three affirmations for the thing that my character had as he was going to get his fourth. And it was a Kickstarter. I had no idea that that line would precede me for the rest of my life. That was the night of a job. I thought that might be one day's work as a hobby, one Saturday night in Austin, Texas, and I would never do it again. And it turned out to be a career. So I take it as a compliment. And every time I hear it, I'm like, that was the first three words you said ever on film 30 something years ago. We have a duty under God to seek the truth. Not with our eyes and not with our minds where fear and hate turn commonality into prejudice, but with our hearts. I had the right mentor director in Joel Schumacher, the late Joel Schumacher, hey Schumacher, um, who was giving me the best direction you could give a young actor who had never had a large lead role like that. Every time as I was studying or come up with ideas, he would remind me, hey, you are Jake. Don't make it complicated. You are Jake, you've done the work. We cast you for a reason. You are Jake Begans. Best thing he could have told me because it kept me out of my head and it let me be natural. And then we were done. A lot of people came and was like, dude, you did it. I was like, what? And they were like, no, I think you really pulled off. And I think we made a, think we made a great movie. And I think you pulled off a really good performance. And I was like, yeah. Felt like it, felt like we added it up day by day and hope so. And uh, I think we did go make a, a, a good movie. You saved my shoe and my, my life. And the shoe's what I was going for. You just turned out to be a bonus. Now come on, we're gonna try and get up. Take your time. Whatever a five threat is what she is. All right, that, that, that woman, that actress is I've never seen someone be able to choreograph something so cleanly and clearly and actually hit the coordination of that scene. It would be two minute scene. Take one's two minutes. Take two's 201. Take three's a minute 59. Take four is 201. She had it down and it was from all the work she would do preparing for the scene. That woman's a worker. That woman is a worker and um, she knows what she wants to do, and she does what she needs to do to pull off what she wants to do. I really appreciate that. You call my bluff? You bet I am. I remember we met on the Paramount lot, I believe it was at the time, and those casting sort of meeting couches, for, especially for rom-coms, are you want to see the chemistry between the, the two leads. You want to see how the jive is. Not reading, we're not reading through the script, we're not reading lines, you wanna see how we... And immediately we were comfortable with each other and we jacked with each other. Thank you, Andy. And we busted each other's chops. And we laughed a lot. And uh, there was a bit of rock and roll exchange that, oh, this could be some, some heavyweight fun. And I think that's why we, 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 I was cast and that's why uh, that's why, for whatever, to whatever extent, it, it worked. Well, that too, the law says that you cannot touch. But I think I see a lot of lawbreakers up in this house. That was a really fun 
set. I mean, I remember when I talked to Steven Soderbergh, I was like, oh, he called me about the role and I hadn't read anything. I was like, you gotta give me one line, one line. And I called a launch pad line that I can just imagine before I get the script of tell me who this guy Dallas is. And he paused and he goes, well, you know, Dallas, the character I was playing was like, he's pretty connected to the UFOs, man. And I was like, whoa, there's no lid on that. So I immediately just took the lid off and thought about, oh, I'm gonna make, this character is in the cosmos. He's not of this frequency on earth. And it gave me a lot of leverage to go make a lot of the choices I did with the character. Star of the show, Mr. Magic, Mike. <laughs> Channing was great, I do remember that. We all, all of the, all of us male dancers had to go pick a song and a dance to work with the choreographer. And it was up to us. And I'm thinking, I think like most people are thinking, oh, hip hop, right? And then I see Channing Tatum do his rehearsal. And as I'm seeing him do his rehearsal, I'm like, I ain't doing hip hop because the best I can do is get second place. This ain't working. So I went and found an old school Kiss, uh, um, Kiss uh, song. Um, Dr. Love and like made a little nostalgic callback to that and of Dallas being the owner. And then I said, oh, well, I've, got to, I've got to breathe fire. You know, that's good. Of course I've got to breathe fire. And then I've got to, I've got to make a song that sounds like I'm being sentimental saying goodbye, Tampa. I love you, love you. <laughs> and then I've got to be like, you can bleep these out. I've got to be like that, break the guitar and go, we're not going out like that. We're going out rocking. You want to play cards? You got cash. I was aware enough to know when you have a script like that, that, oh, if we do this really well, this is something that can be really special and even have, it's one of those, it's a, it's a drama that could, done well, could have great critical acclaim. That's, that's all. And I mean, you know, looking at that versus looking at, say, something like a romantic comedy, they're two different two different things, you're playing two different games. And so I was like, if we can do this story well, this could be a really important film. One of my favorite stories I like to tell is we shot so quick and we were, we were so busy and everyone was so committed to the work. I didn't meet Jared until the last day of shooting. I've been looking for you, Lone Star. And I looked over and there was Jared and I went, hey man, Matthew McConaughey. He goes, Jared Leto. First time we introduced ourselves, we he had stayed in character and I had stayed in character. He stole so much stuff from me on that throughout the shooting because his character was was a petty thief, right? He stole all kinds of stuff from me, um, and and I never called on him, but he knows he did it, and I, I think he knows now that I know he did it. But he stayed in his zone and I stayed in mine. We actually met Matthew and Jared when the, the minute filming was over. There's all kinds of ghettos in the world. It's all one ghetto, man giant gutter in outer space. So, look, that question of going from the big screen to TV to the small screen was a question and it was brought up. But my agent at the time, Jim Toth and I said, and we thought about it for a total of about 20 seconds. I said, look, the script, the dialogue is amazing. I don't give a damn what kind of screen it's on. That, I cannot wait to turn the page and hear what this guy Rustin Cole says. And I, this whole thing was written well. Um, so didn't care what screen it was on. Um, then to reunite with Woody, one of the great things I remember that with Woody is Woody and I have always done sort of comedies together, right? At TV or Surfer Dude, and in life, where I start and Woody ends and where Woody starts and I end, it's kind of murky in a wonderful way. We just add on to each other. Early on in rehearsals, he comes to me after a few rehearsals, he's like, hi, what's the deal, man? Our deal is I hit the ball to you, you hit the ball back to me, I hit it back to you, we volley back and forth, but what's happening now in this movie is I'm hitting the ball to you and you're like you're just standing there letting it go past you hit the back wall and come to a standstill and you're just staring at me it's like, give me something it won't be there's nothing alive or funny about that and I remember going I think if we do that enough times it will be very alive and quite funny and he was like you did it again cut it out. so that was that turned out to be the comedy and in the movie, in, in True Detective, I think part of what is very funny and alive is that you see Marty Hart getting really frustrated with Rustin Cole. That's Woody getting really frustrated with me going, give me something, man. And we laugh about it to this day. For the last time, Miss Crawley, I'm not going to fire you. 
Why would you pull yourself together and please blow that nose of yours? No, 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 not in here. Blow it outside. I become a better storyteller because I have kids. Meaning, I come home from work on something like True Detective, and my four-year-old kids go, what'd you do today? I cannot tell them what the movie's really about. They're not age appropriate. So I have to go into parable form. And so I had to become a better storyteller to tell my kids about a good guy and a bad guy and a monster and this to tell them the parable of the story I was in. And as they got older, I did want to, you know, there's nothing I made that they could see. <laughs> so I was just like, I'd, I'd, I'd like to all the movies. And as you become a parent, what do you end up watching? You end up watching mostly what your kids are watching. And so I was like, man, I've never been a part of animated film. And I, and I like doing voice work. And so I, I went and did that. And Chris Melodonja and Illumination came to me. And so I voiced Buster Moon. They thought it was really cool. That I remember sitting in the premiere of them listening and going, hey, that sounds like. And they had that moment where they looked screen audio, look at me sitting next to him, do the math, <laughs> that, that's you. I'm like, yay, there was that, that was really cool to them. Um, and that was something I did sort of for them and the kid and all of us.